skies don't seem to be as dark as usual the stars seem brighter than they've been before deep within i feel my soul is stirring as though my hope has been restored the shepherds say they've heard the voice of angels confirming spread across the land that a child protected well from Herod's anger is our father's son and the son of man love is raining down on the world tonight there's a presence here I can tell God is in us God is for us God is with us Good morning, church. Good morning. Woo, good morning, church. Hey, I'm glad you are here today. My name is Jesse. I'm one of the pastors here at Waterway, and uh, I'm going to invite the Plord family to come forward. They're going to be lighting the Advent wreath candles for us today. But while they're coming forward, I hope that you will look around, say hello to the people beside you, in front of you, behind you. If you need to stand up, that's all right. <laughs> Make sure you know their name and know who they are and wish them a good morning. John asked Jesus, are you the one who is to come or are we to wait for another? Jesus said, the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised and the poor have good news brought to them. Blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. It's 
Truly I tell you, no one has arisen greater than John the Baptist, yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater greater than he. We light the first advent calendar to, candle to remind us to keep awake and be ready. The second advent candle reminds us to change our ways. We light the third advent candle to remind us of the good news that the blind can see and the lame can walk. Good morning, church. We invite you to stand with us as we start our time of worship this morning, singing Joy to the World with a new little touch on Joy Unspeakable Joy. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare him room, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven nature sing. Joy to the world, the Savior. church. Another welcome to Waterway. My name is Reuben, an elder here. I'm so glad you're here. Uh, if you're listening online, thank you and uh, welcome. Uh, thanks to the Plourd family for doing the Advent candle for us. Thanks to the worship team. Um, we are indeed in the middle of the Christmas, the Advent season. 
if you haven't noticed, here we are. Um, a couple of things. If you need uh, coloring pages for the little ones, they're at the back of the sanctuary. Um, just wanted to highlight the prayer box off to the left um, in the lobby. If you have prayer requests, there's cards out there. Um, you can fill it out, put it in the box, and we'll be, we'll be sure to uh, put it on the email um, and highlight it this morning. Um, for devotions this morning, I want to look at uh, Isaiah 35. I asked Phil Herzog to read it for me. My voice isn't the best. Um, Phil, you want to come up? Uh, just a little bit of background. So this is kind of the perfect Advent passage. Um, Isaiah is looking ahead to, um, to the birth of Jesus, obviously prophesying things that haven't come yet. Um, but I thought it was interesting. So we're in chapter 35, but if you look at chapter 34 and 36, um, it's kind of sandwiched right in the middle of a lot of pain and a lot of heartbreak in the nation of Israel. So in chapter 34, uh, the heading in my Bible says judgment against the nations. So Isaiah is prophesying judgment. Just a little expert. Um, verse 2 says the Lord is angry with all the nations. His wrath is on all their armies. He will totally destroy them. He will give them over to slaughter. Um, that's kind of chapter 34 in a nutshell. And then chapter 36, uh, the very first verse starts, and again, the heading in my Bible says, Sennacherib uh, threatens Jerusalem. And it starts, in the 14th year of King Hezekiah's reign, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, attacked all the fortified cities of Judah and captured them. So this is Israel, this is uh, Isaiah's hometown that it's talking about. Um, if I had one word for chapter 35, I think it would be hope. Um, hope kind of sandwiched in the middle of all this pain that, that Isaiah and his people are dealing with. Um, so keep that in mind um, as Phil reads this chapter. I'd first like to say our small group is studying serving. And so I got a call, several calls this week and and, and the opportunity to serve. So this morning I'll serve as Ruben's voice as he struggles a little bit with cold. He sounds a lot better than he did yesterday. Yeah. I'll say that. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear, your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution, he will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground, bubbling springs. In the haunts where jackals once lay, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow. And a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. The unclean will not journey on it. It will be for those who walk in that way. Wicked fools will not go about on it. No lion will be there, nor will any ferocious beast get up on it. They will not be found there. But only the redeemed will walk there, and the ransomed of the Lord will return. They will enter Zion with singing, everlasting joy with crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. Thank you, Phil. And so obviously Isaiah is looking ahead to all of this. We see some of it come true in, in the life of Jesus um, as he came to earth, and then also in the the last few verses talking about his second coming that we haven't seen yet. Um, and there were several reasons I asked Phil to read that. I probably wasn't honest with him and shared all of them because he wouldn't have come up if I had, I don't think. Um, but I, I thought it'd be um, fitting for a, a grizzled vet of the faith to, to read a passage like that. Um, and also someone, 
as we think about Isaiah and the, and the pain that he's going through in, in this, this chapter of hope, um, someone who's kind of in the midst of that themselves with, with a lot of close loved ones, um, with life-altering health concerns in the last week and, and months. Um, and if you, if you ask Phil how he's doing, I, I'm pretty sure within a certain amount of time he'll say something to the effect that um, we'll just trust, trust God. Um, I know that because he said that to me on Friday, and he said that to me a number of times before throughout the years. And it doesn't seem forced when he says that it doesn't seem like the churchy thing to say. It seems like the, the faith of a life built on Christ. Um, and I thought, what better, what better example to, to read this chapter of hope? Um, and so I ask, you know, can I say that today? Can I, can I be that example of hope? You know, whether, whether this Christmas brings joy and um, certainly Christmas brings emotions from one spectrum to the other, but whatever you're facing, I would encourage you um, in the midst of it all, can we see that hope? That's what Christ came for, um, to bring hope, to bring healing. And I, I, I would encourage us as a church to embrace that no matter what we're going through today. Some uh, Christmassy announcements to go over. Um, the Christmas stockings for the Lighthouse are due back next week on the 18th. So if you could fill them and return them, please. Um, plan to attend the uh, Christmas Eve Eve service December 23rd. Uh, bring a friend. If you can think of someone who uh, especially doesn't have a church home yet, um, that's kind of what the service is designed for. it will be a shorter service from 7 till quarter till 8, um, encouraging everyone to, to invite friends back to your own home for snacks. There won't be snacks here. Um, so plan to attend that. Uh, and then also just highlighting the worship service on Christmas morning. Uh, the service will start at 1030, no Sunday school. There will be some refreshments and snacks and fellowship time at 10 o'clock. Um, just another way to bring someone maybe who's struggling or lonely at Christmas to that service on Christmas morning. <clears throat> also, uh, I heard the escape room got some publicity last week. Um, Rachel did make a Christmas-themed escape room, uh, my wife Rachel. She's not here today. We're kind of shuffling the sick kids around, so you might know how that works. But <coughs> uh, Yeah, the, the escape room is open. I would encourage you, if you're interested, um, stop waiting till the end. Um, there's only so many prime time hours available from now to the end of the year. Um, so if, if you're interested, contact Rachel. You can talk to me. I'll act like I know what I'm talking about, but I'll, I'll tell you to talk to her. Um, if you need some non-biased, uh, you can talk to the Nefs or Stossfuses, um, see what they thought about it. Um, some prayer requests. <coughs> we will pray for the Herzogs. Um, you probably saw <coughs> Phil's brother Dave had a heart attack. Um, he's still in the intensive care unit at Ephrata. Um, had some pneumonia to go with it, broken ribs from everything, and um, just a long road ahead. So we'll pray for Phil and his brother Dave and his wife and the family. Um, just going down through the bulletin, if you want to follow along, the number of people in the congregation caring for aging parents with health challenges, and we'll pray for for all of them as they navigate these times. Um, praying for Renee Gingrich as she fights an ear infection. Uh, continued healing for John Coverley and Mark Hoover and Jim Herr and Joey Neff. Um, we want to remember our December mission support of uh, Bridge of Hope this month. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, also, just want to highlight, um, I think it kind of gets missed, and that's my fault, some or a lot, but uh, the offering uh, kind of loses its place in our prayer time. The offering box is in the back um, or online. We don't want to 
act like we're begging for money, but it is, it is really a part of worship to give our offerings to the Lord, so we want to remember that in our prayer time as well. Um, will you pray with me? <coughs> Lord, we come together this morning and we thank you for the hope that you offer us, the hope that you offer the world, that you came as a babe and uh, lived the perfect life for our salvation. We thank you for the hope of the second coming when you will come back for those you've redeemed, for those who call you their Lord, to take them home um, to the perfect life, a life of no pain and no sorrow. We look forward to that day, but Father, we live... In a world of pain, we live in a world of challenges of many kinds. And so we ask for your help. We ask that we could be the church to those in our midst who are suffering. Show us how to do that better. Help us to offer your hope to the world, to those around us who still haven't found you. Help us to do that with, with love, with tact, with really with um, uh, earnestness, knowing that the time, the time is short. God, we thank you that we can partner with Bridge of Hope. We thank you for the many ministries around us, um, for all they do for, for life in the community. We pray for, for the leaders there, um, for the women who come for support. We pray that your word would be shared, that lives would be saved and um, lives would be one to you through that ministry. We thank you that, that you have given us so much, Father. And we take time to, to lift up the offering. We take time to, um, to remember to give back to you. God, you say we can't serve two masters. We can't serve both you and money. And so we do say, Father, you are Lord. You are Lord of all that we have, and that includes our money, and so we give back to you. Help us to do that generously and willingly. God, thank you for this Christmas season. Thank you for the excitement. <clears throat> and we pray that no matter what our emotions are, we pray that we can see your hope, and we can share that, and we can live that each day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. We invite you to stand again with us this morning as we continue to worship the Lord through song, the first Noel.
tears of a mother A baby's cry is the sound of love Come down, come down, Emmanuel Oh, here's the song for the suffering Here's the sigh of the Prince of Peace has come
musically speaking, you've noticed there's a lot of range in that song. It takes a lot of breath. But did you listen to the words that you sang, especially the last couple? His power and glory ever more proclaimed. That's what we're here doing. I mean, that's what this is about. 2,000 years later, after Jesus Christ lived on the earth, died on the cross, rose from the grave, and ascended into heaven, what we're doing here is still proclaiming the power of Jesus Christ. That's why we do this whole worship thing, right? That's one of the beautiful parts, Oh Holy Night, a musically beautiful song, but also lyrically. What are we talking about? The power and the glory of Jesus Christ and continuing to lift that up. We're not lifting up ourselves. We're not making a big deal about, hey, aren't we neat? No, it's about Jesus Christ and and giving him glory. And so in this moment, um, it is time for me to dismiss the kids to Children's Church so that they can go learn a little bit more about the power and glory of Jesus Christ. So Children's Church today, that's for kids between four years old and first grade. If you're a kid from four years old up through first grade, you're invited. And I'd like to invite you guys to come forward for a minute. And I hope that you're all as excited as Everett. Everett, you look like you're ready to go. You had a birthday and you're four now and you can go to Children's Church. Isn't that awesome? I am so excited that you are all here. All right, now, I know you older guys kind of know how I do this, but for some of you younger guys like Everett, I want to tell you, we're going to pray right now. And here's how I like to pray. I usually put my hands together and I usually bow my head and I close my eyes. It just helps me to remember Jesus a little better. Jesus, we want to proclaim your power and your glory And Lord, we even see your glory coming through these children, through their attitudes and through their joy. And Lord, I pray that they would, with all of their lives forever, proclaim your glorious name. And Lord, now, as these boys and girls go to Children's Church, I pray that you'll bless them. Lord, teach them something. And work in our teachers and our leaders so that these guys can learn something on their level that will change their lives for good forever. Lord, this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Boys, you may walk to Children's Church. (laughs) Not my first dismissal, is it? We're getting this figured out, church. We're getting this figured out. So hey, um, right before I kind of dive into this sermon, I have just a couple of quick announcements uh, that I didn't pass on to Ruben, and I'm glad I didn't. Uh, Hopefully he can save his voice a bit. He's feeling better than he had. But if any of you are feeling like you're over Christmas, you don't want to have to do any of that stuff, go give Ruben a big hug and sit real close to him. And the next two weeks, you can lay low and nobody will complain, okay? But first of all, um, if you can help out, um, one of our friends, uh, Kate, and Kate, I didn't mean to call you out. I hope this is okay, but Kate is going to be moving out from the Oaks House on December 26th, and Kate Fultz could use a hand moving. If you have some hands that could help her move, or if you have a truck or trailer that might be able to help take some furniture on the morning of December 26th, right? That's Monday, the day after Christmas. If you're able to help Kate, you can talk to her or you can talk to me, but we'd like to give her a hand so that, uh, so that the moving can go more easily. Second, uh, the last weekend in January, from the Thursday night, the 26th, until Sunday afternoon, the 29th, um, there is a uh, Wild Goose Events men's boot camp happening uh, up in Clinton County. Men, we've been doing this for 10 years now. This is not just about our church, but there are leaders of, our, of these men's events that are here in our church. I think among the seven leaders, we represent six different fellowships in Pennsylvania, Virginia, and <clears throat> even all the way out in Minnesota. And so uh, if you have been, men, if you have been to one of these men's boot camp events in the last 10 years since we started in 2013, would you just raise your hand real quick? So we've got a guy's retreat, um, and it's open to any of you men 18 or older. Talk to one of the guys who had their hand up if you want to know more about it. Some of them loved it. Some of them didn't. Uh, they'll, give you, they'll give you the full, full story, though. But that's the last weekend in January. You can see wildgooseevents.org wildgooseevents.org if you want to know more about that. And then just um, two more notes. First of all, I wonder, are you sharing your faith in Jesus the way that you say you are? Have you invited anyone here to church in December or for our Christmas Eve Eve service? Do you know anybody who's lonely right now or anybody who just hates Christmas? Well, can you have them over for breakfast and then come to Waterway on Christmas morning? I wonder. One of the reasons why some people really struggle with this holiday season is because there's a loneliness factor or there's an isolation factor. Maybe you can be part of helping to break that down. I just wonder if all of us are living out our faith as well as we'd like to. 
And then here's one final thing before we get into this sermon on Mark um, chapter 15 and 16. So today is the final sermon this year on the book of Mark. We started back in January in Mark 1. Today we're going to be looking at Mark 15 and 16. And I just want to give you kind of a theological note. One of the things that you're going to see in your Bible if you're opening it and reading along today is that Mark 16 verses 1 through 8 are pretty standard, pretty typical, and you'll see what I mean here. But in Mark 16 verses 9 through 20, most of your Bibles have a footnote in it or have a note there or a break, and it says something like this. It says something like, um, the earliest manuscripts of Mark and some other ancient witnesses do not have verses 9 through 20 in them. Okay, so this morning, I am not going to preach about verses 9 through 20. They're fine and read them, but here's the background. Um, a lot of people believe by comparing some literature kind of stuff that these verses, Mark 16, 9 through 20, were added to the biblical script sometime in the 200s or 300s by a person who was copying down the words that had been written so much earlier before that written down perhaps by a scribe. Many of the earliest church fathers, fathers, these are people who spoke and taught and preached in the 200s and 300s, didn't think that these verses belonged, but somehow they kind of popped up. But these verses have been preserved as a footnote in most of the Bibles that you all carry. I'm going to leave you to study those verses on your own. If you have any questions about them, we can certainly talk about them another time. But just giving you a heads up today, I'm going to be preaching through Mark 16, verse 8. And if you want to argue about that, that'd be fun later, okay? But here's where we're going, and this is what this sermon's about this morning, okay? I'm going to give you the ending right now. I hope that by studying Mark 15 and 16, I hope that we can kill bad religion and fear. That is the whole goal today of what I'm going to share with you for the next however many minutes. The goal is to kill bad religion and fear because bad religion and fear are two of the most powerful and cunning traps of the devil. I believe we can kill bad religion and fear by living the truth of Jesus' birth, death, resurrection, and promises. And I think we're going to see that revealed here in Mark 15 and 16. So today we are going to kill bad religion and fear. All right, that's the goal. And so we're going to start this study in Mark chapter 15 and verse 40. Verse 40. Last week we stopped and dropped off in verse 39. It was where the centurion said, indeed, this is the Son of God. Jesus, in, in this section or this chunk of Mark 15, Jesus has just died on the cross. And it says in Mark 15, verse 40, that some women were watching from a distance, that is, as Jesus died on this Roman cross. Among those women were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Younger, and of Joseph, and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed Jesus and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. In other words, there's a gathering of women who are watching from a distance. Mark 15, 42 says that it was preparation day. That is the day before the Sabbath. So as we get the setting, as we figure out the context, it is at this point, Mark is recording events that happened on Friday afternoon. Now, all these years later, we call it Good Friday. Okay? At the moment, for pretty much everybody involved, it didn't feel like a good day. But we call it Good Friday. It's Friday afternoon. And just for clarity, because I know a lot of us don't have Jewish background or experience or really know much of what's going at all with modern Jewish practice, the Sabbath for Jewish folks runs from Friday evening until after dark on Saturday evening. Jewish folks call it the Shabbat. And I know there are some others of you in the room who could give a lot more depth and clarity on it. You can look up Shabbat start and end times online, actually. This morning I did a little bit of a, little bit of a search, and, and you can find, just with a really quick, simple Google search, you can find that this week, that is six days from now, the Sabbath starts at 422 on Friday. It ends at 526 on Saturday. I mean, this is laid out very specifically and very intentionally. And Jewish folks, even in this time of Jesus, would have known this is what the Sabbath is. Friday after <clears throat> excuse me, Friday evening after dark, until after dark on, boy, I am butchering that, aren't I? I'm not a very good rabbi. The Sabbath runs from sunset Friday evening until after dark on Saturday evening. This is what was coming up. This is what was just moments ahead for many of the folks 
who knew Jesus. It says that as evening approached, this is the second part of Mark 15, 42. As evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. So Joseph of Arimathea, knowing that the Sabbath was coming, and Sabbath would have looked a lot different for the folks then than it does now. What is different in your world on a Sunday compared to the rest of the week? There's not so much. I mean, every once in a while you really have a hankering for a chicken sandwich, and you remember that you can't go get it at your favorite spot. But honestly, how is our world different on a Sunday than it is on a Saturday or a Monday? I mean, if you want to go out for lunch today, you can, right? Somebody's willing to work to serve you a lunch. If you want to go shop today, some of you might even do that. How many of you could go find a store that's open? I'll bet you can find them all open today, right? Our world doesn't revolve around Sundays. Our, our world doesn't revolve around Sundays the way that these Jewish folks' lives revolved around the Sabbath. And so there's a bit of a disconnect. It's hard for us to understand sometimes. But here, Joseph of Arimathea, he's a prominent member of this Jewish council. He's a Jewish man. He was waiting for the kingdom of God. He went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Why? Why? Because he wanted to get all the burial work done before the Sabbath came. This is, this is Friday afternoon. Jesus is dead. Some of Jesus' followers were still hanging in there, and they wanted to take care of him, just like you would for a friend who had been executed. Let's, let's take care of our brother's body. And Joseph of Arimathea is saying, the clock is ticking here. Sabbath is coming soon, and I can't work. I can't, certainly can't touch a dead body. There's none of this stuff that can happen on a Sabbath. So Joseph went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. It's interesting, in John chapter 5, as we continue to think about this Sabbath thing, stick your, stick your thumb in here at Mark 15, but if you page back just a few chapters to John chapter 5, there's a story about Jesus going to a pool at Bethesda, okay? Bethesda was a pool that, that got stirred up from time to time, and there were different legends around that, that maybe an angel stirred it up, and if you were the first one into the pool, after the angel stirred up the pool, that you could be healed from whatever your ailment. That was kind of the, the running legend at the time. It says in John chapter 5 that there was a man there who had been unable to walk for 38 years. In verse 8 of John chapter 5, Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And it says in John chapter 5 verse 9 that at once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and he walked. This was, this was before Jesus hung on the cross, before he was arrested, before all that. This is early in his ministry. And so Jesus went to this man who was sitting by the pool. The man couldn't walk for 38 years. Jesus says, get up. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which he took place was a Sabbath. You see that in verse 9. And so the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, it's the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But the man says, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. So they ask him, who is this fellow who told you to pick up your mat and walk? It says in John 5, 13, the man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. And as the passage moves on in John chapter 5, Jesus has more interaction with these Jewish authorities, and we learn more about their concerns and their frustration. We see in John 5, 16, that because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. In his defense, verse 17, Jesus said to them, my father is always at work to this very day, and I too am working. Verse 18, for this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Do you see the stir that Jesus has caused among the folks? Not just because he was healing, but because he was healing on the Sabbath. Now, if any of you were to have a major medical emergency today, which we kind of treat as our Sabbath, how many of you are confident that you'd be able to find a doctor somewhere? Maybe the service wouldn't be as good or as quick or as fully staffed as you might find on a Monday afternoon. But certainly you and I, if we got sick today, we could find relief for that. No, not so in these days. On the Sabbath, everything stopped in the time of Jesus. And, and when, when things didn't happen that way, there was a lot of folks noticing. And there was a lot of offense taken. Jesus has started to stir things up earlier in his ministry not just because he was healing, but because he was healing on the Sabbath. What else did he claim? That God was his father. He made himself equal with God. Now, 
we here in the Christian church these days, and if you're sitting here, I'm going to assume that a lot of you believe, or at least you're open to the idea that Jesus is the Son of God. And so for us to hear that Jesus is the Son of God and healing on the Sabbath, we say, oh, cool, great, heal me. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Not so in these days. Not so in these days. You know, it's easy for us to look back and accuse these Jewish fellows and the Jewish culture of that time of having a bad religion or at least being misguided. How could you, how could you criticize Jesus for healing on the Sabbath? But do we do the same thing? I wonder, you know, it's not necessarily the way that we treat Sundays, but I wonder if are any of you living under some kind of a corrupted or misguided religion? I use the word religion very carefully there. Maybe you don't call what you do your religion. Well, here's a few terms, just so we can be clear. I looked in Webster's Dictionary, right? That's, that's the one that's, you know, always helpful. Webster's Dictionary says this, and the people who publish Webster's Dictionary are really serious about helping us to understand words. By the way, the people who publish Bibles these days are really serious about getting words right, too. So here's what religion is. According to the secular Webster's Dictionary, religion is a personal set or institutionalized system of religious attitudes, beliefs, and practices. Attitudes, beliefs, and practices. It's not just what we believe, but it's our attitudes, and it's the things that we do. That's what religion is. It's all that. Religion is what we think and do, and it's how we act. All that stuff that you think is like important and essential. It might be a personal set, or it might be something you do as an institution. All of that can be under the umbrella of religion. What is important to you? And I want to suggest to you for the next couple minutes that anything in your life can be a bad religion if you're not careful. Now, faith is different than religion. Faith is something that is believed. The Bible says that faith is believing in something that we cannot see. Now, religion, remember, that includes attitudes and practices, and certainly faith will inform our attitudes and our practices. But faith is what saves us, having faith in Jesus. Our religion is then what we do as a response to the things that we believe. You got it? Religion is what we do in response to the things that we believe. Faith is the things that we believe. In John chapter 5, verse 24, Jesus said, Very truly, folks, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged but has crossed over from death to life. Very truly, I tell you, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. All right. Here we come. Back in, back into Mark chapter 15. It's Friday afternoon, soon to be evening. Jesus had been on the cross for six hours before he died, from about nine in the morning till three in the afternoon. A centurion, that is a commander of a Roman army unit, a centurion who would have been familiar with death, who would have been familiar with wounds, who would have seen lots of people die, a centurion who was an officer in this army, looked at Jesus when he died and said, surely this man was the son of God. So as evening approached, Mark 15, 42, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate, asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. Most people don't die in six hours on a cross. Some people took 24 hours, 30 hours, 40 hours, hanging on a cross until they suffocated and died, not able to hold themselves up anymore to be able to breathe. Jesus was dead in six, and so Pilate says, what, the guy's dead already? I'll call the centurion. He knows death. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. Now, this is Mark chapter 15, verse 46. I know we're still at this part dealing with the death and, and, and the burial. It says that Joseph brought some, bought some linen cloth. Excuse me. He was able to still buy cloth from his folks. The Sabbath hadn't come yet. A couple hours later, it would have been the Sabbath time. There was no buying or selling among the Jewish folk. But Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. There's some urgency here. Mary Magdalene, verse 47, and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where Jesus was laid. It's almost like, okay, a couple years later, even, even 30, 40, 50 years later, you know, what happened? Wait, who saw it? Well, Mark's writing this down. Mary Magdalene was there. Mary, the mother of Joseph, was there. Go ahead, talk to them. Nobody's hiding or being sneaky. And now we finally catch up to Mark chapter 16, looking at 
the burial of Jesus Christ, which is, of course, what everybody wants to celebrate two weeks before Christmas. It says in Mark chapter 16, verse 1, that when the Sabbath was over, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought, bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Probably that happened. Probably they bought that late Saturday night after the Sabbath was over. Selling started up again in earnest as soon as the Sabbath was over. But it's nighttime. It's not a great time to anoint a buried body in a tomb cut out of a rock. So it says in Mark 16, verse 2, that very early on the first day of the week, this would have been Sunday morning, just after sunrise, they were on the way to the tomb with the spices that they had bought. And they asked each other, who will roll away the stone from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. Now I want to pause and I want to look and think a little bit about what these ladies are going through. A lot of you are saying, Jesse, I know we hear this every Easter. We know the story. Jesse, you've just got your, you've got your holidays mixed up. Get it straight, pastor. I know. But let's look for just a minute here at Mark 16, verse 2, 3, and 4 with a bit more depth. Here are these ladies, and they are very concerned about taking care of the body of Jesus. They're going to anoint him. They're not going to embalm him, but they're going to anoint his body. They've, they've bought these spices. Very early on Sunday morning, just after sunrise, there would have been some light in the world now. It's a little easier now to be able to anoint this body in a tomb in a graveyard. But do you see what they're worried about? Look at verse 3. Who's going to roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? This is a big stone. And these couple of ladies are concerned that they can't do it. They've worked diligently to get their anointing spices ready, which we find out they're not going to need. And they're concerned about who will roll the stone away, and we're going to find out that it's already done. And it's interesting to note here in Mark 16, at this time, in this place, when, as, as Peter's telling the story to Mark and Mark's writing it down, as these things would have been happening, these ladies were not the only ones worried. Do you know, these ladies were going to anoint Jesus' body, but where were the disciples? Where were they when Jesus' body had been in the grave and it was not yet discovered that he had risen from the grave? Do you know where they were? If we look at the other Gospels we can find, they were so worried they had holed up, they had no idea what was going on. They were scattered at Jesus' death. They're hiding now during Jesus' resurrection. Jesus' followers, the men and the women, the disciples, those who were closest to him, even some who were related to him, they're worried about things that don't need to be worried over. What about the spices? What about the stone? Doesn't matter. It's all fine. What are we going to do if somebody finds out that we're his? I have a complicated relationship with Christmas movies, and I hope you'll walk down a bunny trail with me for a minute. I have a complicated relationship with Christmas movies. Do you have a favorite? I'll bet you do. Almost everybody has one. Most of them are terrible. <laughs> but I like checking them out. I like diving into some of the nostalgia. But most of them are just goofy and eventually annoy me, especially the comedies. Have you noticed all the Christmas comedies, what are they about? They're based on the adventures of someone who's worried about all the wrong things, right? Some family has to travel to have the perfect Christmas experience, but not everybody's there. A dad who has to have the best Christmas lights, but can't seem to get it done. A mom who wants to make sure that the family is just all together, because Christmas is about family, right? A kid who's obsessed with getting the gift he's been dreaming about all year, this is Christmas. Eventually, at the end, they learn a lesson, and it's never the right one. But these are the traditions that, that some of us participate in year after year because it kind of feels like Christmas. These things, these movies have, have, for some people, become part of what a lot of people do at Christmas time. But it's so much worrying about things that don't need that much attention. Is Christmas really about the perfect family experience? No! Grandmas, listen to me especially. Christmas is not about the perfect family experience. Parents with brand new little children, Christmas is not about the perfect family experience. Now go ahead and have your perfect family experience. But that's not what Christmas is all about. If somebody tells you that Christmas is all about something and it doesn't include worshiping Jesus and celebrating him, they're wrong. Don't send them a Christmas card next year. <laughs> well, no, I don't know. Is Christmas about the perfect family experience? Is it about the lights? Hey, lights are fun. We drove through them last night over there at hers. It, it's, but that's not what it's about, is it? Is it about the meal? Oh, I like the meal. I'm starting to get snacks right now. That's not what it's about. Is it about the gifts? 
Grown-ups, uh, we say it's not about the gifts. How about you kids? Do you know it's not about the gifts? Uh, we worry about so many things. Not so different from these ladies walking to the tomb that Sunday morning. You're not sure? You, you think that's other people and not you? How about this? How many of you in the last couple of weeks have said something like this? It's Christmas time. We have to. If there's anything you have to do at Christmas, that's a religion. I kid you not. I'm being dead. If there's anything you have to do for it to be Christmas, that, that's a religion. Now there's some good stuff there. I, I have to sing to Jesus. Great. I have to recognize the birth of Jesus Christ. That's outstanding. But, but you know, if it's not Christmas, unless we eat this one, that's religion. And you may roll your eyes at those Jews who said, Jesus, how dare he? Those Jews who said, Jesus, why would he, why would he heal on the Sabbath? That's our religion. I'm going to tell you, if you have anything in your life that you have to do for it to be Christmas, that's just another religion that you've created. It is your rule. It is your demand. And you know what it's like to live under other people's rules, don't you? Oh, mom is going to do it again. Oh, grandpa, he's going to make us do that thing. Oh, we're going to have to sing that song when we go to church. All that stuff is religion, and some of it can be good, but can we agree that some of that stuff is just bad religion? It's bad stuff that we have to do. It's stuff that puts pressure on us. It's stuff that exhausts us and wears us out. It's the kind of stuff that, frankly, makes some people hate Christmas. It's the kind of stuff that keeps your kids from coming back when you're old. Because you've built up some kind of fake religion that, well, if it's Christmas, we have to. And that's what all those Christmas movies are about, right? Church, be careful. If anybody says it's Christmas time, we have to well, just look at them and be a jerk and say, why? Why? Why do we have to? Why do we have to go to great-grandma's house on that? Why? We have to? I'd be glad to visit great-grandma January 7th. Why? Why do we have to go there? Why do we have to eat this? Why do we have to rush around? Why do we have to take all these kids to two different houses 40 miles apart on the same day and pretend we're having fun? Why? Church, you tell me why. Celebrate Jesus with all your heart, but all these man-made rules, you be careful. Hey, do it with love. If you're going to complain about it to mom, do it with love. She's trying. If you're going to argue about it with dad or grandpa or your brother, do it all in love because our attitudes matter. Everybody's, everybody's just trying to do the best they can, but do you see what can happen? We can get sucked into all this bad religion. We can get sucked into all these demands. We can get sucked into all this pressure that says it has to be this way. And Jesus died so that we wouldn't have to be sucked into all that. Jesus says, no, I've come to set you free. We should be able to be free of the kind of religious pressure that caused so many of the Jews to miss Jesus in the first place. We have to, we have to, we have to. How much of your Christmas has really just become a bad religion? I mean, really, think about this. If you're exhausted, when, if you're thinking, how could I help Kate move on December 26th? That's finally my day to catch a break. I said, what are you doing over the next two weeks that you have to do so seriously that it takes that kind of a toll on your body, your life, your attitude, your kids, your parents, your family. Hey, if there's things that you love to do, go do them and do them with all your heart. And if you're doing a great job focusing on Jesus, you stay focused on Jesus. But what about all these obligations? You know what an obligation is? It's an opportunity to be careful that you're not practicing a false religion. Be careful. We were in Mark 16, weren't we? I'll, I'll get off my soapbox. As these ladies who had been worried about the spices and as they had been worried about the stone, what was going to happen, as they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side and they were alarmed. Of course they were. They walked into a tomb they expected to see a dead Jesus. They saw a live white robe. Don't be alarmed, he said. Verse 6, you're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He's risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. This is why all these songs that we sing are worth singing. 
Lots of babies are born every year. So many of them are really great when they grow up, but we don't sing songs about them. Why? Because they're not going to rise from the grave the way that Jesus did. Don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus who's crucified. He's risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him? Now look at verse 7 of Mark chapter 16. Beautiful stuff here. He says, but go. Tell Jesus' disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Tell who? Who? Whom? Who? Who are they supposed to tell? Tell the disciples, right? That makes sense. Why? Because these are the people following Jesus. They're scattered. They're afraid. But who else is supposed to be told about the resurrection of Jesus? Peter. If you've been reading the book of Mark, what's the last mention that we've had to this point of Peter? Any of you remember? What's the last thing Peter's done? What's the last thing that happened to Peter before this resurrection story that's supposed to be told to him? What happened? Peter denied Jesus, right? On the night that Jesus was arrested, three times, people came up to Peter and said, wait, aren't you his? No, no, not me. Aren't you sure? You look like one of the guys that followed him. No, certainly not me. And, and in fact, the third time, Peter was accused. Peter was accused of being a friend with Jesus, and Peter hurled down curses and said, certainly not I. You've got the wrong guy. In the wee hours of Friday morning, when Jesus could have used his friendship the most, Peter abandoned him. But here, this young man dressed in a white robe says, go tell Peter that Jesus is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you'll see him just as he told you. Just as he told you. In Mark chapter 14, 27, 28, you want to see the reference? Jesus said to his disciples, you'll all fall away. For it is written in Zechariah 13, I will strike the shepherd, the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Jesus said this would happen. And now this young man says to the ladies, go tell Peter it's happening. Go, tell his disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. You'll see him. You'll see Jesus again, this one who was hung on the cross and died, of whom the centurion said he's dead, but he was the son of God. Go, tell Peter, tell the disciples, Jesus will see you and you will see him just as he told you. And as we get into our last verse of the morning, you'll see the tension that exists between Mark 16, verse 7, and Mark 16, verse 8, and you'll see why maybe somebody wanted to write a more complete ending. It's kind of abrupt, but here's what it says. Mark 16, 8, trembling and bewildered. Trembling and bewildered. Of course they would be. We're telling Peter, what? Jesus did, huh? Trembling and bewildered. Any of you that way early on Sunday morning? Just a little bit bewildered anyway. Yeah, I know you are. I see you when you walk in. <laughs> Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. What were they supposed to do? They were supposed to tell the disciples and tell Peter, right? A point about which I've labored here for a moment. What did they do? They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. They're told, you'll see him just as he told you. They ran away and said nothing. As Mark records his gospel, we should notice that no one has any reason to boast. Folks, the disciples, the men, they've scattered. Those who said they would be with Jesus till the end, they are gone. Now the women, they too have scattered in fear. Those who have been so faithful, who have been eyewitnesses to his death, and now to the empty tomb, they fled and they kept quiet. All the people who love Jesus the most are a mess at this point. What are you telling people about this Christmas? What's the message? Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, season's greetings. What do your Christmas cards say, other than I got the kids and the dogs to sit still for a minute? How about the gifts that you're planning to give? What do they tell people? Do they tell people the truth, that Jesus came to set them free from empty religion and set them free from fear? Do they tell... <laughs> Do all the things that we're doing at Christmas tell people that Jesus came so that, so that we can see him even though we've been messed up and, and buried in our sin, even though we've rejected Jesus in fear, just like Peter did, even though many of us are hiding like the disciples did, even though some of us are directly running away from the command to tell people like these ladies did, do we know the truth that Jesus came so that they could all be restored because indeed it happened the way he said it would. They did see him. 
All of these people who were such a mess, who did so many dumb things, who did so many things that make no sense to us today, who did so many things that were just not what we think should have happened. They realize that indeed Jesus is who he said he was, that Jesus did what he said he was going to do, and that he forgives all who come to him for forgiveness. It's really easy to be critical of the disciples and the women when I read Mark's account of the events of the first Easter, but really, how are you and I living? We live in fear, right? That's what motivates you when you say, well, what if we don't at Christmas? We live with worry. I mean, some of you right now are thinking about something that you're worried about for this afternoon or tonight or tomorrow or this week or this end of the year, right? Right? I'm not reading minds here. I just know how people work. Some of you, even in this last hour, you're sitting here singing, oh, holy night, and you're worried about... We live in fear. We live with worry. We wonder about what's going to happen with our future, even though Jesus has told us that things will get worse and worse, and then he'll return and set all things right. We know what he said, and yet how many of you are at peace today, living with the peace that passes all understanding The world can do what it will, but I'm going to be fine because I'm with Jesus. Are you living that way for real? Because that's the life he offers. Not this life of living under false religion and and living under other people's obligational expectations and, and living under the fear and the worry of what if and how. So many of us are wrapped up in bad religion. We we don't call it that, but that's really what it is. It's these it's these attitudes and these actions that we think have to happen. So many of us live overtaken by fear, and we don't even notice it. It's just how it is. What if we could be different? What if things could be different? What if we could be free, you and me, like really free, free from our fear, free from our worry, free from the bad religion that enslaves us? We can be, church. It's what the birth of Jesus, the life of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, the ascension of Jesus, and all the teachings of Jesus. It's what it's about. Jesus is coming to set us free. And freedom, even from bad religion and worry. So here's the comfort I want to give you in the midst of all these challenges, in the midst of all these things to think about, and all the obnoxious asking why. Here's the comfort I want to give you. It's the same as the young man gave the women in the tomb. Folks, Jesus has gone ahead of you. You will see him, just as he told you. Will you pray with me? Jesus, we believe, but help us in our unbelief. Jesus, we want to celebrate you. I mean, that's why so many of us put so much effort into this whole Christmas thing. We want to celebrate your birth. We want to talk about your power and your glory for now and forevermore. Oh, but Lord, forgive us for the things that we've added to it. The expectations, the obligations, and the the empty traditions that, oh, Lord, Forgive us for making this about something that it's not. Lord, give us all wisdom as we interact with our families, with our activities, with our programs, with our responsibilities and our obligations. Lord, help us to navigate this well with grace and with wisdom. Help us to be able to say no when we need to say no. Help us to be able to say, I won't be there when it's not good for us to be there. But Lord, help us to do everything with a full heart and freedom. Lord, we need your help. Just like Peter and the disciples and the women, they all needed your help to overcome their worry and their fear and their their false conceptions. Lord, we need your help too. Jesus, thank you for being our Savior, but Lord, would you please again send your Holy Spirit in a powerful way to be upon us so that we can see what is real, to see what is true, and so we can live like we're free. Lord, help us. Help us. Lord, we love you. And we pray in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, this, this last song that we're going to sing today, it's kind of a mashup of two songs. Uh, For unto us a child is born, and open the eyes of my heart. Lord, I, I want to really challenge you, church. As we are in this season of celebrating, 
the birth of our Jesus Christ. Can you have your eyes open to all that is real and not be blinded by all the things that are demanded? Would you stand and sing with us this closing song? through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. But work for the Lord. Church, work for the Lord in a spirit of freedom. And don't be under the yoke of, of any kind of other bad religion. Do you see what the scripture is telling us? This child was born and Jesus lived. Jesus died on the cross so that we could be free of our sin. And he rose from the grave so that we could be free of the fear of death. And he ascended into heaven so we can look forward to seeing him again someday. And we will see him coming back on the clouds. We will see him. He's going ahead of us. He's preparing a place for us because he loves us. Live now. Live now free of fear. Free of all of the expectations and demands of humanity. Live now. Live now for the Lord who gives us freedom. Amen? Amen. 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 Blessings to you. We'll see you next time.